to another rock show. I'm here with the legendary Rocker Mike. And today <laughs> we are doing episode 150, no, Jesus Christ, 170 <laughs> of wow. the rock show. Yeah. And uh, Mike, who are we talking about today? I think we're talking about this guy right here. Yeah. Yeah. His name is Willie DeVille. Okay. And uh, I think he's probably one of the most underrated musicians of the last 50 years. Uh, a guy that came up through the, the CBGB's Max's scene in the mid seventies in New York and, uh, you know, went on to a more national fame, but never, never quite, never quite broke, uh, way big overseas, definitely broke in places like France. He was, he was huge there. Um, but, uh, as far as America, you know, he had some minor, brushes with success but willie deville uh and particularly his first band which was called mink deville he was the singer guitar player uh mink deville they had a series of records from uh from the late 70s into like the mid 80s and uh very very influential stuff i i kind of I'm, I'm even going to say that like willie deville is the kind of musician that like bruce springsteen wishes he was Okay, I, I I think that like Springsteen, with that whole like American roots music thing that he likes to claim, uh, I think Willie was that, you know, and I know Springsteen was a fan of him as well. So it's 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 not like he wasn't watching Willie, but I just always feel that the if you want to do like a roots American kind of music, uh, you know, and and, and Willie's music started off with uh. A particular look he he had like a almost like bernardo in west side story kind of look like skinny ties shiny jacket big pompadour yeah. right like that okay and uh he would morph later on into almost like a voodoo priest uh kind of thing down in new orleans uh and then he would morph again into a southwest native american influenced kind of look uh, and all, and I'm not just saying look as far as appearance. I mean, he's, he's the, the sound of the music. He was part Indian, Native American. So he got interested in his heritage. And some of that was like incorporated into his music. But anyway, so it's a good story. Um, we're starting the new year off right with this. I've been wanting to do this show for a while. Um, and it's going to be a two-parter. So hang on, hold on to your seats. <laughs> all right. So, um, it, it's 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 fascinating. I think he was born in uh in Connecticut, right? Yeah, yeah. His uh his real name was William Paul Borzy Jr. and he was born on August twenty fifth, nineteen fifty, in Stanford, Connecticut. Now that's a very industrial blue collar area. Um, he grew up in the you know the real working class section of that city, a section called Belltown. Um, he was of Irish. Basque, Spanish, and uh, Irish, Basque, Spanish, and Native American descent, particularly uh, Pequot Indian. Uh, Willie knew at an early age that that he didn't like Stanford. He he felt it was a dead end kind of town. Uh, everybody worked in factories. He didn't want that for himself. 
Uh, he wasn't interested in that kind of blue collar existence. So he turned to music at a young age. Uh, even before becoming a musician, he was very interested in the music of the Drifters, um, other R&B acts that would come through Stanford at times, early rock and roll. Uh, it would be such a thing for him that he would quit high school, okay, and begin hanging out on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which was only a train ride away, not too far. And uh, he would hang out in the Lower East Side in the West Village, a lot of the clubs there, the jazz clubs, the R&B clubs, and stuff like that. Now, by the late 60s, um, New York City had, you know, plenty of what was called psychedelic bands. OK, um, but Willie had no interest in that. Willie wasn't interested in the psychedelic era that was going on. He was more interested in sounding like Muddy Waters, uh, John Lee Hooker, and in particular, he admired John Hammond. Um, he had in like fact, R&B and blues kind of. Influences. That's what he wanted. Yeah, yeah. Which was at that time in the late sixties was kind of unique. Okay, it was something not too many people were doing. I mean, the Stones were always doing that R and B thing. Okay, uh, but in the clubs and stuff like that, the Beatles did a little bit of that too. The Beatles did a little bit. They they touch on a little bit of R and blue. They 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 just oh, early on more catchy. Yeah. Early on, but I would say by the time Willie was making music in the late '60s, the Beatles were doing their, you know, Abbey Road and Let It Be and yeah. all that. It was, they were they were into a different thing. Um, but you know, Willie in particular was interested in John Hammond, uh, and it was his 1965 album called "So Many Roads" that Willie had said throughout his career was like the thing that triggered him off to start doing what he wanted to do. Now, as a teen. While still living in Stanford, he played with friends in a blues band called Billy and the Kids. And later on, he started a band called Immaculate Conception. Now, at age 17, he got married, okay, to Susan Burl, who was also known as Toots. Okay, that was her nickname, Toots. Now, in 1971, Willie and Toots relocated to London. Okay, they decided to go to London to find people that were like minded, you know, musicians that were like minded in doing what he wanted to do. American music of, of the genre he wanted to do was always big in England, okay, at that time. So he thought he could go there and find people that would want to do this like R and B bluesy kind of stuff. So unfortunately it didn't actually work out for him too good. Uh he never really connected with anybody seriously. Um, so by 1973, he had given it a, a go for two years, but by 1973, he came back. And his next band that he put together was called the Royal Pythons. And this band didn't exactly work out for him either. Uh, Willie decided to pack up then and head west to San Francisco and to try his luck there. But he's quoted at this time as saying he wanted to find musicians not interested in doing 20-minute solos which he just referred to as pure ego. You know, he didn't want a guitar hero to do like a Jimi Hendrix type thing, you know, nothing like that. So by 74, under the name Billy Borze, Willie DeVille was singing in the band, in a band with Thomas R. Allen Jr., also known as Manfred, on drums, and bassist Ruben Seguenza on bass, Robert McKenzie, also known as Fast Floyd on guitar, and Rich Colbert on keyboards. The band called themselves Billy DeSade and the Marquis, but would soon change their name to Mink DeVille. Now, Billy Borze would adopt the name Willie DeVille when he started this band, and uh, this was about 1975, early 75. Um, one day, Willie noticed an ad in the Village Voice. Okay, he was able to get the Village Voice in San Francisco. Um, it was a, a uh, an ad inviting bands to come down and audition. Now, he convinced about half the band to, to do it, all right, to go to New York, okay? But the other half, uh, guitarist Fast Floyd and keyboardist Rich Colbert stayed, be, stayed back in San Francisco. They didn't go. Now, after arriving in New York City, Willie hired guitarist Louis X. Erlanger, whose blues sensibilities really helped shape the Mick DeVille sound. 
Okay. Now, during three years from 75 through 77, Mink DeVille was one of the original house bands at CBGB's. And the band contributed three tracks to the Live at CBGB's 1976 compilation album. Uh, the tracks that were, were on that was the very Lou Reed-esque Let Me Dream If I Want To, a song called Cadillac Moon, and Change It Comes. Now, Mink also would play um, Max's Kansas City at times. Uh, that was like a little bit of a different crowd than CBGB's. Uh, he used to play a place on 23rd Street called Mothers. Uh, you know, he might have been considered the house band at CBGB's, but he was also, you know, playing other clubs as well. Now, in December 1976, Ben Edmonds, uh, who was an A&R... A did that, right, Mike? A lot of people yeah. playing different bars, different clubs, just to get the, uh, yeah. the band out there, you know, get recognition. Yeah. So guys who played CBGB, Kenny Castaway, the bottom line, or Continental, all these other places that were around mm -hmm. back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, Continental wasn't around yet, but you're right. Um, they... they they wouldn't, you know, even the Ramones who were known as a CBGB's band, they played Max's, okay? Yeah. They played Mother's, um, places in Queens and stuff like that. You weren't just tied to the one club. Uh, I think that's kind of a misconception. But there were some bands that just were known for playing in one place. And I would say probably like the Ramones with CBGB's is known for that. But um, in December of 76, Ben Edmonds, who was an A&R man for Capitol Records, signed Mink DeVille. Um, he spotted them at CBGB's. Okay, thought they were great. Offered them a record contract. Now, Edmonds paired Mink DeVille with producer Jack Nietzsche. Jack Nietzsche uh, worked with Phil Spector in the early 60s. Uh, he had a solo career of his own. Uh, he worked with a lot of people writing, producing, all that stuff from that 60s era in L.A. Um he was very instrumental in the whole wall of sound thing with Phil Spector. His name's come up before in other shows. Um, assisted by saxophonist Steve Douglas and a cappella singers, The Immortals, they recorded the band's debut album called Cabretta. Now, originally it was released as just Mink DeVille in the United States. It was released as Cabretta in Europe. Um, if you get it now in the States, it's just called Cabretta, I believe. Um, it was a mix of soul, R&B, blues, okay? Uh, it was selected number 57 in the Village Voices 1977 Paz and Jop Critics Poll. And the lead single, Spanish Stroll, reached number 20 in the UK singles charts. The only Willie DeVille recording to ever hit the charts in the UK. Okay, uh, later on he would be bigger in France and Spain, Sweden. Uh, but that was his biggest hit ever in the UK. Um, Cabretta got its title from the type of leather jacket that Ben Edmonds wore. Okay. Um, Willie said that the band was like a Cabretta leather jacket, tough but tender. Um, the album barely made a ripple in America, unfortunately, but it was a sleeper hit for people in the know. Uh, a lot of musicians, people in the club scenes and stuff, they really liked this album. Uh, to me, it's 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 one of my all time favorites. I, I listen to it quite often, actually. Um, yeah. Now, live, they were a big hit in the clubs. Uh, Willie dressed like a cross between, like I said, Bernardo from West Side Story and uh, a cross between that and a pimp. <laughs> you know, his guitar was covered in leopard skin and his bluesy guitar style was a good change from the punk rock of the day at CBGB's. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the band in 78 would follow up Cabretta with Return to Magenta. The lineup was the same, but Nietzsche added some string arrangements on this album. Uh, New Orleans musician Dr. John played keyboards, and Steve Douglas was back again on saxophone. They went on a nationwide tour that year, to back the album. Now, they ended up opening for Elvis Costello and Nick Lowe pretty successfully. Uh, they were well-received with their audiences. Return to Magenta reached number 126 on the Billboard charts, making it Willie's highest charting album ever in this country. And it rode to number 126 based on the strength of tracks like Guardian Angel, uh, A-Train Lady, 
just your friends and confidence to kill. During the Return to Magenta recording sessions, the band recorded two songs for the background of Paul Schrader's movie Hardcore. The tracks Easy Slider and Guardian Angel um, was for that. Now, they recorded three songs at the, during those sessions for the William Friedkin movie called Cruising with Al Pacino. Okay, uh, It was a song called Heat of the Moment, Pull in My String, and It's So Easy. It's So Easy is actually in Death Proof also, the Quentin Tarantino movie. There's a part oh, yeah. with it. Oh, yeah. Actually watched it recently. It's pretty prominent in the film. Um, in 1979, Willie DeVille took his band in a new direction. He recorded an album in Paris called Le Chat Bleu, which means the blue cat. Um, for the record, DeVille wrote several songs with Doc Pomus who had become a fan of the band after seeing them live in New York City. For those who don't know, Doc Pomus wrote a lot of songs in the 60s, uh, the Brill Building, all that stuff. I mean, he's a, a famous songwriter uh, up there with uh, Lieber and Stoller and, and, and uh, Boyce and Hart and Carole King and all that. Doc Pomus is up there with them. Um, he had become a fan of Willie after seeing him live one night, and DeVille hired Jean-Claude Petit, to supervise string arrangements, and he fired the band, except for guitarist Louis X. Erlanger, okay, in favor of all new musicians. Now, accord uh, he added an accordion player, an accordionist named Kenny Margolis, uh, Jeff Sheffon on bass, Jeff, I'm sorry, Jeff Sheff on bass, Ron Tut on drums, and once again, he had Steve Douglas on sax. Now, he also produced the record this time. Capitol Records did not like this new direction for Mink DeVille. Uh, in particular, the songs that featured an accordion. Uh, they felt that they couldn't market that sound in America in any way. Uh, consequently, they because of that, they would only release Le Chat Bleu in Europe in 1980. Um, but despite it, would, it being an import, it actually did well uh, for an import in the United States. So they decided to release it later that year in the States. Rolling Stone magazine ranked it the fifth best album of 1980. Yep. Yeah. I mean, critically, they're, they're getting acclaimed. Every, every, everything they put out is, is critically acclaimed. But Unfortunately. It, they, they probably rolled the dice. All right. You know, you guys don't want to take it out of the state. We'll take it out in, um, in Paris or wherever they took it out and it did great and guess what now you got to take it out of the state because people try to buy this imported vinyl of this uh, yeah. album and you know what sometimes you do that sometimes you got to roll with the dices well yeah I mean he's like this is where my audience is so I'm gonna you know we're gonna put yeah. it out there uh Capitol Records said we can't market it here but it you know it proved to be a, a mistake a mistake because it actually sold well as an import and people are paying more for an import than they would for a regular yeah. record. So yeah. it just, they said, forget it, might as well put it out. So despite the increase in popularity and critical acclaim, no members of the original Mink DeVille band would remain with Willie, unfortunately, but he would continue to record and perform under the Mink DeVille name for a few more years. Uh, he would leave Capitol Records after this album and signed with Atlantic for 1981's Coup de Gras. Uh, the, that was Coup de Gras. That was the fourth studio album by Mink DeVille and was a reunion with producer Jack Nietzsche. He hired German singer Helen Schneider's uh, backup band called The Kick to record the album. Um, track Just Give Me One Good Reason was a strong one on this album, as well as a fantastic cover of You Better Move On, originally done by author Alexander, but made famous mostly by the Rolling Stones. Um, the album did well in Europe, but barely barely made the charts in the U.S. Uh, wow. 1983's Where Angels Fear to Tread was the next long player to be recorded. Uh, this was for Atlantic, and they insisted on two in-house producers, Howard and Ron Albert, Okay, two brothers. Uh, they were a brother combo, that was successful. They worked with Derek and the Dominoes, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, the Allman Brothers, Proko Harum. Um, many people feel that where Angels Fear to Tread saw Willie DeVille kind of reach deeper 
into his Latin roots. Okay, uh, he recorded a salsa number called De Mezado Corazon. How, what is that in Spanish, Rob? De Mezado. Uh, De Mezado. The, the desire of your heart. Desire of your heart. Your, your heart's desire, right? Something like that. Yeah, your heart's desire, pretty much. The single uh, released was called Each Word's A Beat of My Heart. And it got to number 89 on Billboard charts. Now, this album also did well in Europe, but not really in America. It barely made a ripple. Now, the last Mink DeVille record was called Sport and Life. Now he was with Polydor Records. Okay, and it was released in 1985. DeVille and Duncan Cameron get producer credits. Uh, it was recorded at Muscle Shoals Studios in Alabama uh, with the in-house Muscle Shoals rhythm section. Doc Pomus would return on this to write two tracks with Willie, uh, a track called Something Beautiful Dying, and another one called When You Walk My Way. Uh, the album was a hit in some European countries, uh, most notably Sw uh, Switzerland and Sweden. It did very well. Got into the top 20. Wow. Willie, in 1986, uh, in an attempt to restructure his life, which included a bad heroin addiction that he had, okay, uh, he fired his personal manager, Michael Barnett, and announced that the band name Mink DeVille would be put to bed. Okay, so he was he was killing the name. He was going to go solo as Willie DeVille. Um, ironically, Mink DeVille would play their last gig in New York City where they started, and that was on February 20th, 1986. All right, Rob, so that's the end of our first part. Okay, what do you think of Willie so far? Pretty good, but um, that last show that they played, none of the original members were in. The band was pretty much done. Yeah, yeah, it'd been a few years since he had any original members. Um, he was just going by that name out of routine. Um, but this was a very hard time for Willie. Uh, he had, like I said, he had a bad heroin addiction. Um, in the early 80s, his marriage with, with Toots would fall apart. Uh, I don't know much about Toots other than things I've heard that, you know, she was a handful, okay, um, and, uh, he would remarry, which, um, I'll get into a little bit in the second part, but, um, you know, he, he, he seems like a guy at this point that, you know, is devoted to his career, wants to turn it around and decides that, you know, I'm going to go solo here. Okay. And use my, use my name. It's what I'm doing anyway. It doesn't matter. So I might as well just use it as Willie DeVille. Yeah. Cause once he, once he disbanded, like, you know, um, Minka DeVille, pretty much it was it was done. It was just pretty much him with a bunch of other bands. Or yeah, and I believe he was using a lot of pickup musicians. And, you know, yeah. I don't think he really had anybody steady in those early years of the 80s. Uh, even for live shows, he, he didn't have a lot of steady people. Um, but, you know, when he would come to New York, he was, he was, he was you know, playing places like the Ritz and, and, and uh, Irving Plaza and... Uh, you know, decent, medium-sized clubs at that point, you know? Yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah. So this is uh, episode one of Witty DeVille. We'll be back in two weeks with part two. And uh, we got another uh, special interview. So we're bringing somebody in. Who are we bringing in? I shall our... uh, we're going to bring in the wonderful Donna Destry, okay, to talk a little bit about Willie DeVille in part two. So thank you for watching. Have a good one, and we'll see you next time. Take care, people. I want to get up top tonight. Listen to Rob Ross and get rock on my On the only podcast that I'll hear. Off my ears. Hey, the rock show, 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 the rock show. Oh.